Okay, so welcome to this fourth video on uh, skeletal muscle contraction. So, so far what we've discussed is how acetylcholine will uh, diffuse across the synaptic cleft from the axon terminal of the stimulating neuron and it will bind to uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which are within the sarcolemma and two acetylcholine molecules will bind to each nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and uh, they will trigger the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor to open and which then allows positive current to um, flow into the cytoplasm. This then triggers that portion of the sarcolemma to undergo an action potential. So if I draw out the whole myofiber again down here, then here is our muscle fiber here. Okay, so uh, if the axon terminal was here, then what's happening now is that an action potential is occurring on the portion of the membrane around where those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are. So what we now need to look at is how uh, the action potential occurring at this little portion of the membrane here is going to spread to neighbouring portions of the membrane. And the way it's going to work is that when these voltage-gated sodium channels open, and a little bit of extra information for you is that this, the specific voltage-gated sodium channels that you find in skeletal muscle is NAV 1.4. So that means uh, that this alpha subunit of the voltage-gated sodium channel is encoded by the gene NAV 1.4. Okay, so when these NAV 1.4 voltage-gated sodium channels open and allow sodium into the cell to trigger the um, upstroke of the action potential here, that's going to bring in uh, some sodium into the uh, intracellular compartment here. This sodium, which is depolarizing the membrane, is going to diffuse out from this area where it's initially come into. So you're going to get rises in sodium in neighbouring portions of membrane to this portion which is actually undergoing the action potential. So when sodium goes up uh, in the neighbouring portions of membrane uh, within the intracellular compartment, what that is going to trigger is it's going to trigger this initial depolarization. So if I draw another one of these graphs of voltage versus time, then initially if we're now looking at this piece of membrane here, so we'll look at this neighbouring piece of membrane here, then initially it's at negative 85 millivolts across that membrane. So the electrical potential difference across the membrane is negative 85 millivolts. Now, when sodium diffuses from this portion of the uh, intracellular compartment beneath this um, portion of the membrane undergoing an action potential to this next portion of membrane, that's going to depolarize uh, the electrical potential difference across this membrane. So it provides the initial depolarization. And if that depolarization is above uh, the threshold potential for the activation of these NAV 1.4 voltage-gated sodium channels in this next portion of the membrane, then this portion of the membrane will undergo an action potential too. That will allow sodium to come in here, and then that sodium will diffuse to the neighboring portions of membrane afterwards. Uh, so you'll get sodium diffusing into this portion of the membrane, and this portion of the membrane will then undergo an action potential. And in this way, what happens is that the action potential propagates along the sarcolemma. Okay, right, so how is this actually going to lead to contraction? Well, in the sarcolemma, you don't just have... Um, the, the structure of, a, of the sarcolemma is not just the outer surface of a cylinder, basically. The way I've drawn it at the moment, I'm suggesting that the cell membrane of this um, muscle fiber is just, basically, it's in the shape of a tin can, if you like. So it's a very stretched out tin can, and it makes up the tin. But in fact, what it has is it has indentations, invaginations inwards of the membrane. So get rid of that bit there. And the, there are lots of these sort of invaginations of the membrane into the cytoplasm of the muscle fiber. And these indentations of the sarcolemma into the depths of the myofiber, these are known as T-tubules. And the T in the T-tubules stands for transverse tubules. So their full name is transverse tubules. Transverse basically means perpendicular to. So these indentations are perpendicular 
to uh, the cell membrane here. So they, that's why they're called transverse tubules, because they are perpendicular to the main sort of plane in which the membrane is in. Transverse tubules. Right, okay. So you have these indentations of the membrane into, uh, into the depths of the muscle. And basically, this is important because if um, because the action potential is going to conduct along the membrane. We've already discussed that in myofibers, you have loads of um, structures known as myofibrils. So this myofiber is going to contain loads of myofibrils. So let's say this is a myofibril. You've got another myofibril. So you have loads of these chains of sarcomeres. Now, uh, basically, the action potential is going to trigger, and we're going to see exactly how it's going to trigger the sarcomeres to start contracting. But if you didn't have these transverse tubules, the action potential would only actually be in contact with those myofibrils, which were on the outside of the uh, myofiber. So if I look at this, um, I look at a cross section of the myofiber. So if I look at the myofibers that I've cut it, so I've cut the myofiber in half, and I'm going to look at the end that I get and look at the myofiber rills in there. What I'll see is I'll have loads of these little myofibrils within the myofiber, and these are just strings of sarcomeres all attached together. So, basically, if I did not have the T-tubules, the uh, changes in the electrical potential, these action potentials in the membrane, they would only be able to uh, activate contraction in the myofibrils that are close to them, basically. So you'd get contraction in those myofibrils close to the membrane, but the ones in the deep depth of the cell wouldn't contract, and that's not ideal. And so the way you get around this is you have these invaginations of the membrane deep into the depths of the cytoplasm of the cell. And I should also say that just like the cell membrane has uh, another name in mus skeletal muscle cells, which is the sarcolemma, cytoplasm also has another name in um, muscle fibers. And sarco oh dear, sarcoplema, sar let me try again, sarcolemma. So cytoplasm also has another name in skeletal muscle cells, which is sarcoplasm. Okay, so uh, you have these T-tubules which invaginate deep into the sarcoplasm of the myofibril uh, fiber, and that allows this alteration in electrical um, activity across the cell membrane, across the sarcolemma, to be uh, uh, transmitted, the signal to be transmitted to the myofibrils which are more deep within uh, the myofiber. Okay, right. So, what's going to happen is that the action potential is going to continue conducting along this uh, sarcolemma, and it's going to go down into the T-tubules. And in the T-tubules is where uh, the, um, the activity, the electrical activity happening along the sarcolemma is going to be uh, transduced into a calcium signal. And that's obviously why I've put this topic in my playlist on calcium signaling, because uh, you have this electrical signal being transformed into a uh, calcium signal. Right, so how does this work? Well, let's draw out a bigger T-tubule here. So here is our T-tubule magnified up now. And basically what you find is if you look at the microscopic structures of T-tubules, you find them always, always in these triads. So I'll have a look at it. Uh, and, and basically what a triad is, is you see this T-tubule in the centre with two structures around it like this. And basically these structures around, which I will just finish off here so I won't leave them open like that. These structures here are endoplasmic reticuli, but because we're in muscle, again, they are often called sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is one sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then you've got another sarcoplasmic reticulum on the other side of the T-tubule. And this arrangement where you've got two sarcoplasmic reticulums uh, on either side of a transverse tubule uh, here, that's known as a triad, and it's a very common arrangement that you see all over the place in skeletal muscle. So this is another sarcoplasmic reticulum. Oh dear, sarco, that should be plasmic reticulum. Okay, 
So, we've discussed how the action potential is going to propagate down the, uh, the membrane of this T-tubule. Now what we need to see is what happens next, basically. And what happens next is that you have, in your uh, membrane of your T-tubule, you have what is known as a dihydropyridine receptor. Now this is the old name for what this receptor is. So this little thing here is, you will see this very common uh, be talked about as a dihydropyridine receptor when you look at skeletal muscle physiology. However, it has another name in the rest of physiology. It's the same receptor uh, that you see in other places all over physiology, and it's the L an L-type calcium channel, effectively. So, it used to be referred to as the dihydropyridine receptor, and that name is still very pervasive in um, skeletal muscle physiology, uh, but um, the more common uh, name for it when you see it elsewhere, because this receptor is seen elsewhere, is that it's an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. And basically, what does an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel mean? Well, it's a voltage-gated calcium channel, and voltage-gated calcium channels have uh, a quite complicated structure. So let me just talk about the structure of a voltage-gated calcium channel. Basically, they are like voltage-gated sodium channels, in that they have um, an alpha subunit, which has four domains. So here are these four domains, one, two, three, four. Um, but these four domains are all made up of a single polypeptide, and that's called the alpha subunit, or the alpha-1 subunit, to be more specific. Okay, and there are loads of different genes that can code for alpha-1 subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels. And the gene that you use to code for your alpha-1 subunit determines overall what type of voltage-gated calcium channel you are. Now, if you are referred to as an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, which is what a dihydropyridine receptor is, or, and I, or I should have said this at the time, dihydropyridine receptor is often abbreviated the DHPR, if you are uh, an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, it means that the gene you use to code for your alpha-1 subunit is in the CAV1 family. So CAV stands for volt voltage-gated calcium channel, and the 1 family consists of four different genes. So CAV1.1 is a gene, CAV1.2, CAV1.3, and CAV1.4. These are all genes in the CAV1 family. And basically, they all code for alpha-1 subunits that can be used to make a functional voltage-gated calcium channel. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.